I think when I started this, I mentioned that, that our role is to try and ballpark what we think is the at least the underlying category as the cause for the respiratory distress. But our main goal after that is to detect the complications of the treatment of, of whatever disease it is. And one of those has to do with endotracheal tube and catheter positions. Uh, this is not a difficult topic, but you know, trying to figure out where the endotracheal tube relative to the crina and newborn is a little bit more difficult. Uh, I often can't see the crinum, but what I almost always can see is the left main bronchus. And I simply follow it back to the sagittal plane of the trachea. And if it touches the tube, then you know the tube's too low. So that's what I do. Uh, endotracheal tubes in newborns never, never have a cuff. So it's not uncommon uh, to even have a unilateral, unilateral intubation where it's not causing much in the way of atelectasis or obstructive emphysema. Uh, as in this case, he's got mild bilateral disease uh, and is intubated for some other reason. Uh, but it is a right main stem bronchus intubation, but it's not causing any uh, focal abnormality with the lungs. All right, here's a patient, and you can again, you, you can see the left main bronchus, and you can see it touches the tube. In this case, the right main intubation is causing partial collapse of the right upper lobe. And as an incidental finding, you'll notice this patient has a large pneumoperitoneum. Uh, I think you can faintly see the falciform ligament giving you the so-called football sign. He happened to have a uh, perforation, I think, from NEC, or it could have just been from uh, ibuprofen administration. Uh, so again, right main stem bronchus intubation, mild atelectasis in the right upper lobe. Here you can see the patient's left main bronchus that obviously touches the tube, so this is well into the right main bronchus. Uh, and it might be causing mild hyperinflation of the right lung. In fact, it's actually causing a right pneumothorax. It's too lucent. We'll talk more about pneumothorax in another session, but there's like a medial lucency. You can see the posterior recess is much too well uh, defined, much too lucent. So there's a subpulmonic and medial pneumothorax. So they didn't collapse anything, but they blew out his right lung, uh, causing a pneumothorax because of the unilateral intubation. Okay, this is, yeah, even though you really can't see the left main bronchus, you can clearly see that this endotracheal tube is way too low and it's causing complete collapse of the left lung, which is obviously uh, not, not unexpected, although it doesn't have to happen. Uh, but uh, definite uh, right main stem bronchus intubation. All right, this patient, you can clearly see the left main bronchus, so the endotracheal tube is well into the right main bronchus. It's causing complete collapse of the left lung, complete collapse of the right upper lobe, and the fact that you really lose the entire heart border, there's actually probably some middle lobe uh, atelectasis here as well. The only uh, lobe that's aerating is the right lower lobe. These last cases I just uh, throw in just to let you know it can happen because it's very par paradoxical, but every so often we'll have a newborn with a unilateral intubation that's actually causing collapse of the lung that's intubated. And what's happening here, here's the left main bronchus. You can see that the tube is, is into the right main bronchus. So what's happening is you have obstructive emphysema of the left lung that's causing passive atelectasis and mediastinal shift uh, that effect on the right lung. So this is paradoxical atelectasis uh, of the intubated lung. Okay, I have to talk briefly about umbilical catheters. Uh, they're not that difficult. Uh, I wish I actually uh, had a lateral abdomen to demonstrate the course of the umbilical vein catheter, which, as you know, runs in the anterior abdominal wall, whereas an umbilical artery catheter uh, goes inferiorly from the umbilicus into the internal iliac artery, then up the aorta. So it's very posterior and intimate with the spine whereas this portion of the umbilical vein runs in the anterior abdominal wall. It's only after it dips through the ductus venosus and the IVC that you can relate it to the spine. Uh, so generally on a straight film, the umbilical vein catheter will look like it overlies the right side of the spine, and the umbilical artery catheter overlies the left side. But as I'll show you in, in a minute, if the patient's rotated, the umbilical vein catheter is going to go from way over here to way over here. So you can't use the right-left uh, orientation to decide what kind of catheter. You're not always going to have the luxury of them, including the umbilicus. So this is the classic course of an umbilical vein catheter. It goes straight up from the cord, from the uh, remnant, 
umbilical artery catheter goes down then up. And as a general rule, they want the, uh, the, inf the uh, umbilical vein catheter in the infracardiac portion of the inferior vena cava. Umbilical artery catheters, they want uh, between about T6 and T10 or below L3. That's the general uh, uh, area. Uh, this is a patient where they were a little bit aggressive with the umbilical artery catheter. Now, it's, you can't tell because they didn't include the umbilicus which one this is, but the one that stays to the left of the spine and goes all the way up here is basically going out the uh, aortic arch into the left subclavian artery, which it can do. And the other one that looks like it's to the left of the arterial catheter is actually in the umbilical vein because he is turned to the left. You see how these ribs are longer than on the right? So that's the tip of the umbilical vein catheter, and it's in the right atrium in this case. Okay, I'm really not sure exactly what they were trying to do here, because you can see the patient is rotated significantly, significantly to the right. That's why the umbilical vein goes way to the right. And I don't know if they thought they were putting, I don't know what they were doing here, because they already had an umbilical artery catheter in, and then they actually have two catheters, the umbilical vein. And the main purpose of this, and one tip ends here, the other tip ends here, and although it doesn't make a whole lot of sense, the, a general rule is if they, uh, if they thread an umbilical vein catheter in too far, it doesn't go up the SVC. It doesn't usually go into the right ventricle. For some reason, the, the path it tends to go is across the atrial septum and if far enough into one of the pulmonary veins. So uh, if, if, if you're not sure if it's a catheter that happens to be crossing the tricuspid valve, into the right ventricular outflow tract to the pulmonary artery. If they can't tell clinically, which they should, because obviously pulmonary vein blood will be arterial, pulmonary arterial blood will be venous, but uh, if they can't tell by that or the pulse waveform, a lateral chest is, will, will tell you what you're dealing with. If it's in the pulmonary artery, it'll be very anterior. If it's the uh, pulmonary vein, it'll be very posterior, exiting from the left atrium. Okay, this is a, a uh, one day old baby who happens to have jejunal atresia, that's why he's got dilatation of a very few uh, uh, dilated loops of bowel. This is actually the duodenal sweep and this is actually the proximal jejunum. Uh, but just to demonstrate, when you are rotated way to the left like that, the umbil this is the umbilicus right here, you can see the round water density structure. Umbilical vein catheter down then up, umbilical vein catheter straight up, and if they're rotated to the left, the umbilical vein catheter is going to be way to the left of the aorta because it's an anterior structure. No matter how badly you're rotated, since the aorta sits on the spine, it stays to the, uh, on the left side of the spine no matter how much you're rotated to the left or to the right. Okay, this is obviously a very edematous baby. I think he had high drops. Uh, and it's really mainly to point out, here's his umbilical vein catheter going straight up from the umbilicus, and it's crossing up into the, I would bet you this is the left pulmonary vein, because that is the course that they tend to, tend to take. The umbilical artery catheter is in satisfactory position. This is an example of an umbilical vein catheter entering the right atrium, and it's crossing the atrial septum and extending out the lower lobe pulmonary vein. Uh, this was not perforating the right atrium, which is probably what uh, some people might think. Uh, they pulled it back after this film. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't uh, uh, mark the other one. But this is this is not an unusual course for an umbilical vein catheter that is threaded too vigor vigorously. The umbilical vein, as you I'm sure know, is a tributary of the portal venous system. Uh, and every so often, instead of going through the ductus venosus and into the IVC and into the right atrium and further, often they'll actually extend into a branch of the portal, portal system. Uh, the most commonly is for it to curve over into the, a branch of the right portal vein. They can curve into the left portal vein, and I think I have a case here where it actually extends into the uh, splenic vein. This is the case I just mentioned. Uh, I think that's too inferior to be in the left portal system, so I actually think it's, it's, it's curled back on itself into the portal vein and into the splenic vein. And uh, obviously they don't keep catheters uh, anywhere within the portal system because that further increases the risk of portal vein thrombosis, which is the whole reason why umbilical vein catheters, even that are satisfactorily positioned, are not left in for very long because of the 
uh, increased incidence of portal vein thrombosis and portal hypertension. So here's another patient with a left-sided pick line, and it's sort of at the junction of the super, superior vena cava and right atrium. They would still pull this back somewhat so that it is in the SVC proper. This is an unusual case. This patient happened to have esophageal atresia uh, that was actually diagnosed at several weeks of age. It wasn't suspected for some reason, even though he did not have a distal fistula and always had a gasless abdomen, but he went on to develop significant chronic lung disease. So here's a pic, and he also happened to have tetralogy of Fallot. Uh, here's a pick line that you can see is sort of following the course of the descending aorta. And it's not uncommon in a premature infant to inadvertently hit a brachial artery or an axillary artery or a subclavian artery. Uh, and I was very concerned that this actually was an arterial catheter with a tip in the descending aorta. Uh, and I informed them of that, and again, they, they can usually tell by the oxygen saturation or the waveform, but uh, they actually did a follow-up film that answered the question in this case. This is the follow-up film in that patient. It's actually a different catheter. They switched to a jugular catheter. And if you'll notice, down here it, turned toward, it turns towards the right atrium. So either they perforated the descending aorta, which is highly unlikely, or this is the classic course of a so-called persistent left superior vena cava. If you have a patient that has congenital heart disease, they have up to a 15 or 20 percent incidence of a persistent left superior vena cava. If you have a catheter that just parallels the spine and you can't see it turning towards the right atrium, you can either tell them to, to do the waveform or do the oxygen saturation you can look at the cardiac echo because if the patient has a persistent left supreme vena cava, they will usually comment that it's there. Uh, if, if all else fails, all you need to do is a lateral chest because a persistent left supreme vena cava will be more in the middle of mediastinum, whereas a catheter that's going into the descending order will obviously be overlying the spine or in the posterior mediastinum. Uh, the incidence of persistent left supreme vena cava is only like 2% in the general population but it's much higher, as I said, 15 to 20% in, new, in, in people that have congenital heart disease. Just to point out, here's a left-sided pick line, and it's certainly not following the course of a left brachiocephalic vein, so either he has a persistent left cerebrum in cava, or this is an arterial stick, and it's actually in the uh, aortic arch of the proximal descending aorta. And by examination, uh, this was an arterial catheter, and they removed it very quickly, and, and Try it again with a pick line from the, uh, of the opposite uh, axillary area. So again, they can look very much the same, and usually you don't have to resort to, ultra, to ultrasound or to, uh, or to lateral chest. You know, again, just the, the examination of the blood uh, or the waveform findings, uh, they can answer the question whether it's arterial or venous. This is another patient that uh, uh, the catheter obviously is not running the course of a left brachiocephalic vein, and he does have cardiomegaly, but he didn't have congenital heart disease. He didn't have a persistent left superior cava, so this is another arterial stick with the catheter in the descending aorta. Okay, this case is kind of subtle, but you know, here's a right-sided pick line, and for some reason, he's not really rotated, and it's like, why is that going so medial? over the spine. Usually the SVC doesn't sit in that area on a straight film. So this course looks like it's extending into the ascending aorta and that's exactly where it was. It was an arterial catheter. Uh, again, it's not, it's not real difficult in one of these tiny premature infants to inadvertently do a percutaneous stick and hit, hit an artery as opposed to a vein. Uh, obviously they're, they're right next to each other as you know. Uh, just be aware, sometimes we're the first people to notice that, that, that a catheter may not be intravascular. You can see the significant swelling in this child's chest wall, the axillary area. Uh, he's not that rotated. Look how far his scapula is pushed out. Uh, so this is tremendous extravasation of, uh, of intravenous fluid because the catheter is no longer intravenous. Uh, so we may be able to pick, up, pick that up before the clinical findings are apparent. And believe it or not, that actually was the case in this uh, patient.